She was a British royal who found herself mired in controversy and rumors. She was the first Queen of England to be publicly executed, and she seems to have been wiped from history. Today, to close out our Persons of Intrigue month, we take a look at the life of one of the most interesting figures in British history, Anne Boleyn. This is Red Web. Welcome back, Task Force, to our final episode in our month, dissecting persons of intrigue from our history of this great, great planet, Earth. I am your resident mystery enthusiast, Trevor Collins, joining me as he does every single week with his gut instinct hearing these mysteries for the very first time, Alfredo Diaz. The last one. Last one. There's a lot um, of mysterious people out there. It's hard a, to pick. There's a ton. And honestly, I was going to say I want to... I want to hear from the task force. Like, what Ooh. what were these mysterious people? What was like the one mysterious person that you're like, I want that person to be covered? Yeah, yeah, look, yeah, yeah. We could run this month back another time. Part two. You know, part two. Because uh, there's a ton of great people. This was a fun month. Yeah. Um, For me, people we missed, God. Yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, uh-huh. Tony the Tiger. And the Monopoly Man. Right, right. There's a lot. Listen, and I, I'm picking up what you're putting down. There's a lot of mystery left yeah. on the table, on the yeah, board, I should say. Like, <laughs> like, what do you do when you land on free parking? Do you collect any sort of fees? <laughs> or do you just sit there? I mean, that's a good question. House rules. There's a lot of answers out there. But yeah, so Anne Boleyn is a very interesting person. And unique to the other persons of intrigue that we talked about this month, what is is interesting about her is that her history is kind of lost. There are gaps in the knowledge we have in the history books as to maybe pieces of who she was and how she came to be who she was. We're going to get into all that. But counter to the other episodes where there's more theories trying to fill those gaps, we're going to dissect the history that led to those gaps in the knowledge. We won't be able to provide that knowledge, obviously, because it's lost to time. But we're going to talk about the story that created Anne Boleyn's mystery. And I think it's very fascinating. And it's also a, a great bookend case because it let me just, spoiler, it reflects right back to Shakespeare to loop you back over oh. through this month once again. It ties into the whole month nicely then. Oh, yeah. So queen for three years? Queen for three years. That's very short. Mm-hmm. And if you know anything about her husband, King Henry VIII, at that time, I think it speaks loudly. It speaks volumes. The man had, what, six, six wives? Jesus. Yeah. And we're going to dive into all those hairy little details. And then, of course, as we do at the very end, we're going to talk about maybe some of the theories kind of surrounding some of those answers and then have our own instincts as to maybe what happened during this woman's lifetime. Okay. Fun fact, there's a Broadway musical about the six wives of Henry VIII called Six. It's very good. Really? Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. Oh. (laughs) I had no idea. I've listened to it and it's very good. Lots of children, (laughs) child Mm -hmm. support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. 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 All right, so let me take you back in time, but before we begin, some of the themes we're going to talk about today include murder, infant death, and torture. Anne Boleyn was born in Blickling, Norfolk in England, and historians believe that she was born in either the year 1501 or 1507, but her birthday is unknown. Despite her fame, there is very little remaining documentation from Boleyn herself, such as her diaries and her letters, so most of what we know about her comes from the opinions of various other people's words of mouth, as it were. Mm. And you know... We know that very well. Oh, yeah. If you've been a fan of this podcast for long enough, Task Force, you know that word of mouth is not always accurate, but it is sometimes the most... It's the only thing we can go off of. Right. It's the the last (laughs) remaining bastion of any sort of information. Now, her father was Earl Thomas. He was a popular diplomat, and her mother was Lady Elizabeth Howard who had relations to the royal court as well. Most of her childhood was actually spent in Hever Castle in Kent, England. In 1513, at the rough age of 12, we presume, born in 1501 or 7, Boleyn was sent to Burgundy, Netherlands to serve as a maid of honor to Archduchess Margaret of Austria. I would assume that she was 12 and born in 1501 because to become a maid of honor at the age of what? Six would be pretty wild. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, little, it's a little intense even for those times. Yeah. So Margaret of Austria, just for what it's worth, was the governor of the Habsburg Netherlands at the time. And she was also the first female regent in the Netherlands. I think we're going to see how this might have impressed upon Boleyn as an individual, because we're going to grow to know her as a pretty strong, independent, thoughtful woman 
who kind of spoke her mind. And that definitely, as you're going to see, it rubs a lot of people at that time the wrong way. Let me just put it that way. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, she was educated with her family and in the Netherlands on math and grammar, as well as domestic activities like needlework, dancing, and household management, to put a few out there. At some point later on, we don't know when, she also learned a few other skills, such as archery, hunting, and horseback riding. Later, Boleyn's father sent her to France to be the maid of honor for Queen Mary. She stayed for at least six years, and she was able to study even more subjects, including French, philosophy, literature, and music. Now, this stems from a time that is hearkened in fantasy writing all the time. I'm cruising yeah. through Brandon Sanderson's novel, The Way of Kings, right now. And, and there's a character very familiar to Anne Boleyn who is desperately seeking kind of like a mentor figure yep. from another highly educated, also independent woman. And this is such an interesting time because we go to school, right? And you yeah. learn all the subjects all at the yep. same time. You go there. I'm so fascinated with how history is like, well... This person's good at this one subject. Go live with them and for a few years and learn those four specific things. Learn math over there. It's, I don't know. I find that interesting. Do you think that that would help? Uh, lessons stick to Not to that you? degree. Yeah. Um, I feel like that's just too specific. I don't know if you need to go as broad as school does nowadays. Sure. But that is something where it's just like, you, you're not, you're too young to know that you're not being exposed to enough. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, in a sense. Yeah. Yeah, so it's like too far one way and too far the other way. I can see that. Yeah. Now, as a result of all this education and living with Queen Mary for those six years, she had more of a French cultural background and perspective, something that the public and the English court would be simultaneously jealous of as well as critical of. You're going to see that kind of manifest, perhaps. These are things I just kind of want you to have in the back of your mind as right. we talk about the unfoldings of her life. Now, beginning in March 1522, Boleyn began to serve on the English court along with her sister, Mary, a different Mary, for Catherine of Aragon, the Queen of England and King Henry VIII's first wife. So King Henry began to pine after Boleyn once she began working on the court, but it is said that she refused to be his mistress and would not sleep with him unless they were married. This was extremely unique for that time period, but she was turning away his advances just wasn't having it. Just wasn't having it. Yeah. Yeah. Ruffling his feathers from an early stage. Right. Knowing what she was about. I, I like that. In 1527, Henry actually wrote a letter professing his love to her, and it is said that he wrote at least 17 letters of this type to her, but none of her responses have been archived to the point where we don't have those letters in return. Yeah. We have seen his. Maybe hers was just the word no on a parchment paper, and he just and bundled it, it up and chucked it or in the fire. A, just, you know, left on red. Left, you know what? <laughs> left on red. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, she sent the pigeon back, but I didn't see a, a, a scroll upon its ankle. Nothing. The crow came forth, but no parchment in return. I've been left on reed. <laughs> I feel like it would be, I don't know, man. Like, yeah, you, you know, you train pigeons and they carry your pigeons and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there's just like, you know, every once in a while you're going to have a really important note that's just like fastest way most is carrier pigeon. I don't know if this pigeon's going to get scooped out of the air <laughs> right. by a hawk right, right. or shot with an arrow. You know right. like, Do you think she the had... most important letter that I ever send to somebody yeah. is going to get gobbled up. Right. Do you think she had a list of 17 excuses as to why maybe she didn't even see it? She's like, oh, I don't know. I've got a lot of hawks around here lately. A lot of, a lot of pigeon, pigeon hunters. You know... <laughs> Pigeon, pigeon hunters. hunters. We got a rabid pigeon band hunters. of pigeon hunters out there <laughs> popping shots at your message birds. <laughs> I mean, eventually you get exhausted for the excuses. But anyway, <laughs> in order to marry Boleyn, Henry tried to divorce his first wife, Catherine, but his request had actually been denied by the Pope. Divorce was not allowed by the Catholic Church at this time. And a lot of my history buffs out there are probably going, yes, that's why there's all this change, the Protestant Reformation, the Church of England, tut, 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 we're going to get there. Some sources claim that Henry and Boleyn had a secret wedding in 1532 before an annulment was allowed. Instead of waiting for the approval of the Pope, Henry cut ties with the Catholic Church with the help of Chief Minister Thomas Cromwell and set a precedent that the Church did not have more power than the royalty in England. I'm kind of glossing over a very big, yeah, 
big There's move. A lot of things that I'm kind of glossing over, but the point is, if the church wasn't going to allow him to have his divorce, he was going to find a different way to enact that to to be okay, yeah. to make it legal, to make it okay, ethically speaking. Now, this decision and Cromwell's influence brought about the English Reformation and what would become known as the Church of England. This changed the Christian practices of England to be more Protestant instead of Catholic as they had been up until this point. A very dramatic shift for the future landscape of yeah. England. In January 1533, the marriage of Anne Boleyn and King Henry VIII was official. Afterwards, Catherine was banished from the royal court by Henry and Anne Boleyn was then named queen. That's just messed up to the nth degree. That's harsh. You you pretty much were like, you were you were married, and then I mean they get look, so side chick Emily's a side chick. He's like she's got a look to her. You know I got I'm, those that I'm fine hooked, orange locks. You know possibly getting married behind the scenes before mm-hmm. the divorce and all that kind of stuff, and then, and then see stuff like this would not fly today, and then. You go on and like marry your side chick, and then like kick out, yeah, your pre- like your ex wife, mm-hmm. and then just move her in. That is where were the tabloids? Ooh, right. That I mean, you get absolutely roasted. Oh yeah. I mean, you wouldn't. That that would not fly today. You just see. I mean, I'm woefully. You also do it, but like right. Yeah. Right. I'm woefully uninformed on the royal drama. As of recent, right? But apparently, like, with people leaving the family or, like, excommunicating or whatever, whatever, that is drops in the bucket next to what Henry VIII was just beginning to do with creating drama and the wild social fabric. Yeah, like, six wives. I mean, Mm -hmm. if you did this with just one of them. Yeah. Oh, the other five, like, good luck. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, we're going to talk, of course, again, I hear those uh, buff minds in the task force out there saying, hey, history is complex. There's a lot going on. We're going to talk about some of the other things going on with Henry VIII and his heirs and and, and why this is kind of entering the picture, but allow us to continue. So soon after the official marriage, Boleyn gave birth to their daughter Elizabeth on September 7th, 1533. Elizabeth would later become known as Queen Elizabeth I. Oh. Mm Mm-hmm. Queen Elizabeth I. Also, fun fact, I just realized this. This was named after her mother, Lady Elizabeth Howard, and... Then subsequently, flash forward to very modern history, you have the recent passing, the late Queen Elizabeth II, who shared the same name. Uh, yeah. Uh. So anyway, following Elizabeth's birth, Boleyn and Henry tried to have a son in order to have an heir that would inherit the throne. So this is a huge part of the picture here. The absence of a male heir was a major sticking point for Henry VIII. It's also what spurred on his earlier divorce with Catherine, as despite her many pregnancies, only gave birth to one healthy child in Mary. So again, as I kind of implied, only one child survived to adulthood. They did have a son earlier on, but he only made it, I think, a few months and then passed away that very same year, unfortunately. And this is a, a thing that kind of plagued their marriage and also kind of followed Henry throughout his many attempts to have sons. This particular set of um, pregnancy issues or uh, just... Yeah, it does okay. follow into Anne Boleyn's, um, some of their attempts to have children. But I do think it kind of continues on throughout the many wives. And oh. also perhaps why he was so ruthless about moving through wives and trying to find Jeez. someone who could give him a, a male heir. Yeah. But anyway, Boleyn's marriage with Henry was said to be tumultuous. They had periods of strong passion, and then other periods of strong fighting. Some very high highs, very low lows. And whether this is part of the reasoning for butting heads or not, it should be said, like I said, that Boleyn was a strong and independent woman. She had gained a reputation for speaking her mind. And as you can see, or maybe feel out, as it's mid-1500s, mm-hmm. there's a lot of misogyny just kind of caked into society. Right. And Henry VIII is really seeing his wife in general as a way to get an heir. And so he has yeah. his principles that would not maintain to this day, mm-hmm. but that could have been part of the conflicts that they had. Those were the times. Mm-hmm. So flashing forward a bit, Boleyn, like Catherine, had multiple miscarriages and stillbirths, 
which led to even more resentment from Henry, who started seeing a mistress. And in fact, multiple mistresses at this time. Oh my God, bro. You got to believe if he's looking to come cheat on somebody with you, that when you yeah. get into the picture, I don't think the tune's going to change. No. Yeah. Oh man, this man's full of side chicks. He's full of side chicks. Now in January of 1536, Boleyn had another stillbirth of her son, and it is said that this is what led to the downfall of her marriage. This tragedy coincided with Henry getting into a jousting accident that almost killed him just two months after. So we have a tight period of a lot of things going on. January, the stillbirth of the son. March 10th, Henry VIII almost dies in a jousting accident. Before the joust, actually, Henry had forgotten to lower his visor and was hit in the face by an adversary whose helmet prevented them from being able to see very well or hear much at all. And so you had a conflation of just two not great moments. His visor's up. The what, What's the pole called in a joust, Christian? Do you know? Like what they're they're using as yeah. the weapon? Yeah, the pole arm. I think it was just I feel pole. like I have the answer, but yeah, I... I a lance. It's called a lance. A lance. Yeah, what, what am I? <laughs> I was like, anyway, I know it's right that there. That big old stick with a <laughs> yeah. fist at the end. Yeah, I knew um, what you were talking about. Yeah, I don't know why I blanked on that. I anyway, mean, that's look, why you're that's here, Christian man right in the chair. You, gotta, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? You right. gotta put that thing down. Right, right, what, right. Did, what are you doing? Uh, when um, I look at jousting, I go, what is anybody doing? Yeah. <laughs> Cut well, it out. Yeah. Well, <laughs> down, yeah. boy, down. Yeah. You know, unless it's a knight's tale. And, you know, that's what you gotta do for a lot. Uh-huh, uh-huh. The thing, too, is just like... <laughs> the guy get in trouble for hitting him in the face? I don't know. I mean, I'm just something know. we wouldn't That's know, it. but just like you that, almost you killed very, the king, right? You almost <laughs> killed the king. You, you you're doomed. You're done. I mean, look, that's a near death experience, and this guy's trying to chase down um someone that can give him an heir. Mm -hmm. So in in tandem with each other, absolutely. Like, look, I could have died, and then I had no one to carry on my lineage. Right. You're totally right. But on top of that, there are sources that claim that Henry suffered a traumatic brain injury as a result of this accident. And it was said that he exhibited severe personality changes afterward. I mean, this is something that is oh. like, you can follow these kind of things, brain injuries, shifting personalities yeah. as, as old as time. So you think of these two traumatic events, plus the near-death experience being like, let me self-reflect, plus the personality shift. You can imagine, a lot's going to change real quick, and it does. So on May 2nd, only four months after the miscarriage, two months after the accident, Boleyn was arrested for treason, adultery, incest, and witchcraft. And she was sent to the Tower of London, now known as Byward Tower. I feel like they just slapped a bunch of crimes on her because he was trying to get rid of her and move on to someone else, and that he learned that going to the church... I mean, at this point, there could be, that could be a burnt bridge and yeah. it could not ma matter at all. Sure. But if there's any, if there's any, anything there was salvage and there's any type of mutual respect, there could be just the fact that like, hey, it's very hard to deal with going to the church, requesting a divorce, all that kind of stuff. It's He's like, get I already, denied. I already dang changed I, I, the church. I tried that. Yeah. And I <laughs> What's changed my the next move? And, and then, you know what I mean? Like, that's already an issue. Mm -hmm. If I just say that there's all these crimes... Then, you know, get people behind me and be like, whoa, didn't know she was so bad. Right, 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 right. I mean, of course you got to like do what you got to do. Sure. And to kind of back up those rumors, there are mm, some reported claims that try to, because these aren't just necessarily throwing out too many, just like, let's just say this and that and the other. There's some backing to each of them and we're going to break oh. those down. But my in instincts, my inclinations are right there along with yours. So Boleyn was rumored to have relationships with other men outside of the king, including with multiple members of the Tudor court and a Swedish writer named Mark Smeaton. These rumors originated from reports of Boleyn's conversations with these men, though it's unknown if anything beyond these conversations actually occurred. Boleyn's actions and conversations were reported directly to the king for what it's worth. He, he basically had people that would watch after her, maybe even follow her to just see what she got up to. And Smeaton himself, that Swedish writer, did claim or confirm that there was a relationship, though the truth of his claim has been cast into doubt since then. And we'll touch on that a little bit when we talk about the theories and some of the end thoughts. But in total, there was five men, including Smeaton, who were arrested due to their suspected adultery with Boleyn, though 
all of them maintain their innocence, with the exception, of course, of Smeaton. I mean, look, it's all bad either way. Mm -hmm. Cheating is cheating. You shouldn't be talking to someone intimately. You know, when you have somebody else, that's cheating. You don't have to be physical. I will say, to the extent that people are getting arrested, I feel like you should know whether or not stuff went down. They they could be writing back and forth, especially this like yes. Swedish writer. Be probably writing the the the, the sweetest smooth, the, the sweetest words, the smoothest, sweetest, nastiest things. <laughs> oh, right. Okay. The and Swedish then, can get nasty with and it too. And then just nothing comes to be. Right. So right. like that's that's different levels. That's like um you know hey you talking to someone we done yeah as opposed to I'm gonna lock all you all you up mm -hmm. and it's over for you. I think it's pretty understood that some flirting was involved. That this is the the type of person that she was. But every time she flirted with somebody, it was reported to Henry. In fact, whether that was the norm for these conversations is a no. She simply could have just been having conversations with people and you make a joke and somebody laughs. Somebody sees it from a distance. You're like, why are you laughing? Don't Boom, be laughing. That's, you're laughing too hard yeah, at what Anne's saying over here. Kick it up to Henry. Having too much of a good time. Yep. Yep. So however you want to take that, it does feel a little bit of like, listen, this is not a relationship podcast. It could be. <laughs> I'd reach out to my boy's hands and we'll hold hands. No, they don't want to. Um, <laughs> that hand came out so quick and went away so yeah, fast. It, 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 not was time to it was just a it was a formal gesture. <laughs> and, and that's it. No, it it was performative. Was. But but the thing is, like, just talk. Just talk to one another, okay? Mm -hmm. Let me just write that on a pigeon and send it back. You well, know, it's like, not gonna make might not make it. Right. Well, uh, she might leave me or he might leave me on red. You know, yeah. both of them. I don't know. Hawk Swoop in. I just think you, they need to be your talking. Pigeon and your relationship. There's a, see, there's a lot of assumptions flying around, and I think you know what? If you need to just be honest with yourself and say it's because of not having a son, then like that yeah. kind of sucks. But like, let's not throw out all these other accusations. But anyway, I digress. Mm. I gotta remove myself from this relationship counseling session. All right. <laughs> So supposedly she told Sir Henry Norris that if her husband, now this is the cornerstone of some of these claims. So this is a little bit more important. Now, she had many conversations with many people. Sir Henry Norris was one of them. And it is said that in passing, she said, now if her husband were to die, that he, Sir Henry Norris, would be next in line to marry her. Quite a thing to say when flirting to somebody. I mean, it's very open and comfortable, I'd say. But whether it was a joke or whether it was truth, it doesn't really matter because you kind of can't say something like that. This joke implicated her in conspiracy and treason. Yeah, I mean, you can't be talking ill of the king, let alone talking about the king's demise. Right. Like, these were the times. Right. You know what I mean? You're like, like, wait, what do you mean me dying early? That's Are you trying to say you're going to kill me? Conspiracy to murder and I almost, stuff like that. They I almost just died over there two right. months ago. Yeah. What are you trying to say? I mean, they, they you know... They execute people on very little, just hearsay, you yeah. know? And so, like, if you're, it, it, it could all be manipulated, you know? Absolutely. It's, it's not as extreme as Game of Thrones, but, like, people were always conspiring back and forth and trying to gain the system and mm -hmm. and, and be in the, um, you know, the right-hand man of whoever. Right. Yeah. Always mm -hmm. trying to climb that ladder. And, like, yep. you, it's, like, one of those things that even when talking about this, it's really hard to figure out what is the truth and what is the case like because you know we watch reality tv shows and so our indication is to maybe assume that oh maybe it's just a confidence thing or maybe it's just a, a promiscuous thing and i'm like this is this is much hairier than i would have thought and yeah. uh, it definitely as you said kind of feels game of thrones and you know sometimes history can be stranger than fiction mm. but yes either way this joke talking about killing the king referencing the king dying in any way was considered a threat and a betrayal Hence, the treason, conspiracy, etc. And because Boleyn spent a lot of time with her brother, George, she was accused furthermore of incest. And based on this evidence alone, George too, well, spoiler alert, was executed. Jesus. Yeah. Spending time with your brother, it's like, boom, incest. I mean, like, right. I feel like that's fishing right there. Yeah. It seems very much like, hey, you know, I want an heir, but also you need to stay here with me consistently because, well, I don't know, man. Is he projecting? He's the one seeing mistresses on the side. I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, but very often it's very one-sided. Yes. You know? Absolutely. I don't want you to do that, but I'm doing that. It's archaic. <laughs> it, yeah, it's it's gender roles. You, you see that stuff, like, nowadays. And, it, and it'll even roll into both sides. Sure. You know, both genders. Yeah. Um, 
So yeah, man, this is this is some relationship stuff. I'm I'm over here just like <laughs> you know what I mean about all this all this relationship stuff. Uh -huh. but, yeah. Now, with regards to the final accusation, King Henry VIII believed that Boleyn had used witchcraft to make him fall in love with her. Rumors had spread about Boleyn having a sixth finger, as well as a wen, W-E-N, also known as a cyst. It's like a slow growing, almost like boil, usually on the neck, and it develops over the course of time and gets a little larger. And those two things sound very strange, but as it goes, those were, air quotes, common signs of a witch at that time. And because she used a necklace to cover up that that cyst, that boil, it was like kind of a de facto admission to like having this or something. Like, why is she always wearing a necklace? Ah, this. Though it's worth noting that Henry also started making these claims after their marriage had begun to languish. So again, just want to provide full historical context that on one hand, it could just be him trying to save face, giving a reason to find yet another wife like he had done in the previous, or maybe she was just a witch and casting spells. <laughs> like you got to give both sides their so, time. Then, yeah, they're, they're fair, <laughs> fair time of, of thought. Um, Six like, fingers, though. I feel like you just go, show me, if, you know what I mean? Like, High five! You're, if you're in the <laughs> right, him. high five, Got him. you're in the crowd. Right, we don't need to burn. We don't need to sink. We, you know, don't throw them in the river. Just high five. Right. Hey, how you doing? Wave. I mean, granted, like you can't speak up, but I just feel like you know. I just picture instantly in my head. There's you know the executioner, and then you know maybe she's a boom guillotine moment or whatever. And there's like she's gonna you know she's a witch. She's got six fingers. And then someone in the crowd just goes, show us your hands. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then he's like, arrest that guy. Yeah. <laughs> Who is that? Who said that? Who said that? Get him out of here. You know, oh, like, man. it just, I, I, everywhere I go, every picture I take, if I'm being painted, my hands are up for right. eight hours. He's just know? like, he's flashing the number 11 <laughs> like, you know, with both hands. Like, bam, my hands are up at all times. It's, yeah. it's just like, and then also the, the sis was probably there for a bit. You know, and then he was like, oh, well, uh, I'm just fishing for any excuse, any any which way. Oh, that's a common thing for mm -hmm. witches. I talked about, I didn't care about it before. We are in love. But now that I, like, I want nothing to do with you, I'm going right. to, you know, flip it on you. Right. He shifted the whole landscape of England's religious scene so he could get himself into a place where divorce would be approved. Right. So with that in context... It's hard to not see some of this as reaching for reasons yeah. to, I'm going to move on now. Mm. Um, I get it. I get that you want a son, but uh, ah, this, is, this is a lot. Well, hello there, Task Force. It is once again that time in the episode to pause for just a second, kind of ease that tension down off the mystery. Because, you know, you get, your brain gets a little rattled when you're confused, lost, dazed and everything, Fredo. I mean, you get dazed and hazed and... All the time. We just push through it. Constantly rattled. <laughs> but I do want to say huge shout out to our first members over at roosterteeth.com. If you don't know what that is, it is our, essentially our Patreon. It is the way to support this show in addition to all the other sister shows, as we call them here at Rooster Teeth. And if you want to learn more about it, you can go to roosterteeth.com slash sign up. But essentially to break it all down, it supports us directly. It is a way for you to support the show as a fan, a member of the task force. And to be totally honest with you, if you get a month membership, that is the equivalent of listening to hundreds of ads. And on top of that, once you become a first member, you don't have to listen to any ads. It is an ad-free experience, and 100% of that goes to support us directly. There's no middleman. No one gets a cut of this. It all goes directly to us and whoever else you might listen to under that gorgeous, large rooster teeth umbrella. So thank you again in advance if that's something you want to consider. Really appreciate your patronage. But otherwise, like I say all the time, there are so many ways to support the show to support the show freely as well, such as reviewing us, whether it be on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. We're trying to get those numbers up because it bolsters us in an increasingly algorithmic world. So thank you all so much for supporting the show and being part of the task force. With that said, let's talk about some of today's fantastic sponsors. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Life can be pretty uncertain at times, and when you're at a crossroads, it can be hard to decide which direction to take. It's like standing at a fork in the road, not knowing which path is right for you, which one you should choose, or what that path holds. 
Making important decisions can be tough, whether it's about your career or relationships. But therapy can be an essential tool to help you figure your way out through this confusion and this wild world that we live in. I really appreciate how simple BetterHelp makes it for both people who know therapy and have taken it before and people who are experiencing it or looking into it for the very first time. Their website is super easy to use. They get you a licensed therapist that is designed for your specific needs because they give you a short questionnaire to ask you for all that good stuff. And if you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's a convenient and flexible option because it's entirely online so it can fit your schedule no matter how wishy-washy it may be. Let BetterHelp be your map on this journey. Visit BetterHelp.com slash RedWeb today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash RedWeb. This episode of RedWeb is also sponsored by Rocket Money. Now that pretty much everything is a subscription service, it's tough to keep track of just how much we're spending each and every month on them. Did you know, Fredo, by the way, that about 80% of people have subscriptions that they've completely forgotten about? Yeah, I'm in that statistic. Oh, well, you use Rocket Money, so you would know. Yeah. <laughs> I am absolutely floored that it's 80%, but I wouldn't be surprised. There's a few things I can think of for myself. But seriously, think of how many free trials that you've subscribed to, and then you had to put a card in, and then you just forgot about it, and then it triggers into a real thing, and then it just keeps going, and you just didn't realize you were paying for it for years. That's me with a few things I can think of. It's, listen, Rocket Money is the ultimate personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, it monitors your spending, and it helps lower your bills all in one place. Yeah, I mean, I use it. It's easy. They send me a weekly little email that shows me what I'm spending and where my money's going, which is great because (laughs) who doesn't want that in a simple, easy to read email? And on top of that, I kind of realized... Yeah, the subscriptions piled up, not just, I mean, everyone thinks about like the entertainment subscriptions, but what about the video games you you subscribe to, the services you subscribe to? Yeah, that piled up. So I saved myself a good chunk of money, Uh, hundreds actually, because I just had a lot of subscriptions going. (laughs) You look, I got a significant other. She's got subscriptions. That's true. <laughs> you know what I mean? like, yeah. That piled up quick. Right. And no, so it was I nice to that. be like, I don't use that, 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 that anymore. So I'm going to get rid of that. And I, I go, love Sweet, that they, more money in my pocket. I love that they cancel it for you too. Mm-hmm. All within the app. You just go, I don't want these. Yep. And they handle it. Yep. You don't have to go it's to quick figure out where it's at. Go through no. the rigmarole of calling somebody. They do location. it. So task force, stop wasting money on things that you don't use. Cancel all those unwanted subscriptions and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash red web. That's rocketmoney.com slash red web. And just in case, get your notepad out, rocketmoney.com slash red web. This episode of Red Web is also sponsored by Shopify. You hear that sound? It's the sound of a sale that you're missing out because you're not selling on Shopify. And what does it sound like with Shopify? Ah, uh, yeah, that's much better. Yeah, I like that. I, see, I love the sound that just came that out. Coming. Did not see that one coming. Start selling with Shopify today. Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Shopify puts you in control of every sales channel. So whether you're selling satin sheets from Shopify's in-person POS system or offering organic olive oil on Shopify's all-in-one e-commerce platform, you are covered. And once you've reached your audience, Shopify has the internet's best converting checkout to help you turn all of your shoppers from browsers into buyers. Listen, Task Force, you know us. We've talked about store.roosterteeth.com. We use Shopify for our own merch. That's right. You don't even know it because Shopify is so good at making a more bespoke experience. So no matter what your business is or what you're selling, you can make the website look exactly as you want it. We've really enjoyed our Shopify experience, and we've been able to do some wild things such as unique discounts, bundling, and selling things as wild as our sippy cup of knowledge. And you guys have all really enjoyed it. So even if you didn't know, you've used Shopify as a listener. So thank you so much. Sign up for the $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash red web, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash red web and take your business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash red web. With that said, let's dive right back into the mystery. So with that said, we kind of talked about her background. We talked about her being brought into the royal family by way of marriage. And as I kind of implied, let's talk now about, unfortunately, her early end, the end of her 
royalty, but also the end of her life, as well as some of the theories and some of the legends that surround her. So Bullen was found guilty, and the court scheduled her to be executed on May 18, 1536, but it was delayed. King Henry decided that Boleyn would be beheaded with a sword by a skilled swordsman rather than burned at the stake in a final act of mercy, as it's been said. I feel like mercy would have said, you know what, you can walk on. But I guess a swordsman is less brutal than just burning alive. Gruesome question. Yes. When you're beheaded, Mm -hmm. does the the sword and the action... I mean, I guess with enough force it goes through the spine... Yes. Quite easily. Um, so I think that's why we, and I say we, Jillian wanted to specify that this was with a skilled swordsman mm-hmm. because guillotines, not always, but often, often enough to be reflected in history, don't work on the first go. Sometimes axes, sometimes swords. It Sometimes, yeah, you whack and hit and it does a, a partial decapitation or just like a severe wound. Yeah. Which takes another hit or two. Right. See, that's um, what I was thinking. I'm like, this can't be cl- just a clean cut, yeah. like, boom, one swing. I think this one might have been. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, yes. This one. But I'm Otherwise, like, like, not all the time right. is it a I mean, clean... but this one is just like a high level of, ex- you know what I mean? Like, this right. is, you know, by the king, skilled swordsman, etc. You probably got like small towns and kingdoms, all that kind of stuff. They got blunt blades right. and, and none of that smooth. I use this on a tree just down the way. Are we good? Kind right, of thing? yeah. Like it's dulled oh, yeah, by okay. the maple. I right. just hock down. Yeah. But coming back to it in a, in a more serious tone, I mean, the, the mercy sake of it all is definitely, it, it was definitely seen as an instant like kill. Essentially a painless death as opposed to obviously burning at the stake. <laughs> which would be a lot more gruesome. I mean, burning... Being burnt alive or drowning just seems like the absolute worst yeah. ways to go. And if I'm not mistaken, Christian, maybe you can help me out, but I believe that that execution style was strictly due to the claim of witchcraft. Am I right? The or, burning at the stake? Yes. Thing? Rather than like if it were the other three claims minus witchcraft, it'd probably be like guillotine else, or, or beheading. Yeah. So you're basically asking, was burning the stake only for yes. witchcraft? witchcraft? Or yeah, was that, quote. for some reason, a standard form of execution as punishment? Oh, must have been witchcraft. It wasn't, I mean, it, it wasn't standard, but it was a, a method An of option. execution. Yeah. Okay. Depending on the time, the country, yeah. the government, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it has been used as a form of yeah, execution in the past. Yeah. I, I just know it in the context of witchcraft because, I mean, we've talked about that on the podcast before, but also just you know, stories of witches, mm-hmm. but I was just, you know, I was just curious because like oh, for sure. mi- early to mid 1500s seems like a brutal time. Yes. For a lot of reasons. Now, it was delayed, I mentioned, but only the day. So on May 19th, 1536 at 9 a.m., she became the first queen to be executed in England, though the exact location of her execution depends on the source that you read. She gave a short speech before her execution and accepted her death without admitting guilt, though her exact words also depend on the reporter or the source. These are two quotes that I'm putting together. They weren't necessarily in this direct order. Good Christian people, I am come hither to die according to the law, for by the law I am judged to die, and therefore I will speak nothing against it. If any person will meddle of my cause, I require them to judge the best. They were much more well-spoken back then Yeah. for the brutality that they lived around. But Boleyn also prayed before the execution cut off her head. And the legend says that witnesses saw her lips continuing to move after she was beheaded. Could be muscle spasms and... Could be. Could be. Or was it proof? So studies have shown that brain activity does in fact continue up to 30 minutes after the heart has stopped. Jesus, 30 minutes? Yeah. And movement could still be possible with leftover blood oxygen, but not for very long. I'm sure there's not a whole lot of tests of people being spontaneously decapitated and then watching what happens, but as best as you can kind of gather from scientific evidence. Now, if the legend is true, many wonder what Boleyn was trying to say, if anything. Many suggest that she was still praying, right? That as I mean, that I'm was what- I'm assuming it would, con- yeah, mm-hmm. just- Mimicking a prayer. Yeah. Like, if that's what her brain was on and that's what she was thinking all the way up until the final moments, then you can imagine if there's any activity continuing after the instant moment, then yes. Though there are some that are convinced that this was actually evidence of her witchcraft. 
11 days after Boleyn's execution, Henry was remarried. Again, 11 days. And in 1558, her daughter, Boleyn's daughter, Elizabeth, became Queen of England, introducing the Elizabethan era of Shakespeare, the first person of intrigue that we discussed earlier this month. Elizabeth became known as Queen Elizabeth I, and whether you know history or whether you know the Kate Blanchett movies, uh, you might know that Elizabeth I never married. Some historians believe that despite how young Elizabeth was when her mother passed away or was executed, that Elizabeth was very influenced by Boleyn. It's worth saying that she was only three years old at that time, but she did in fact keep a lot of her mom's items and heirlooms, things like rings, books, and other things of that nature. And so simply growing up and knowing her story could have impressed upon her as a woman in this era. So wait, how long after did Elizabeth become queen? That was 58, so that would have been 22 years after um, Boleyn's execution. Oof. Yeah. Now, as you can imagine now, with those 22 years and Boleyn's daughter being the, the next queen, jumping to the conclusion that Henry VIII didn't have any viable sons in yeah. any of his remaining marriages. And honestly, looking back, and this is just pure conjecture on my part, but it almost seems like there were fertility challenges that maybe were centered on him that he, you know, however you want to take it, karma or genetics, he was plagued there forward with yeah. trying to have kids. Yeah. I'll keep it that way. So it's unknown for certain if Boleyn was actually guilty or innocent of her crimes, but Boleyn is said to be a very flirtatious individual, though she may not have been trying to be flirty in general. She might have just tried to be friendly or funny. Right. That is a, right. That's just a general disposition people can have. She was headstrong in general, and she didn't behave the way that perhaps the royal court would have expected of a woman at that time. What she said to Norris could have just been taken as a flirtatious joke with no ulterior motive, but again, it was the cornerstone for everything that led to her execution. Some historians believe that Smeaton was most likely tortured into confessing the adultery. That was the Swedish writer who said, yeah, we had a, a thing. And it's an interesting thing to confess, especially if you know you're about to be imprisoned or executed for it. So you are either tortured into saying it, perhaps, right, or maybe bribed in some sense of the way. We may never know. Now, according to historian Eric Ives, the time period where Boleyn had been accused of courting Smeaton, interestingly, she was in a completely different city. So even now, even though the historical records are very thin of Anne Boleyn, and we'll get to that in just a moment, but they're very thin, we can actually place her in a totally different time than when she was supposedly having this affair with Smeaton. You know, that doesn't surprise me at all. Right. I'm I mean, sure there was a lot of abuse of power um, in order for, the, for Henry to get what he wanted. Right. And that's where I start to say, like, Yes, there's a lot of other things going on, but kind of looking back now, you can start to see some of the holes in the accusations, of course, wild times. But on top of that, Henry VIII and the Tudor period in general was very known for its tortuous punishments. And so it's very likely that uh, torture could have been part of these pictures, part of pulling claims out of people. Now, some other people yet believe that she was framed for political reasons and not just because of Henry's disapproval of her. The motivations for this could be because of her speaking her mind, going against how many, like I said before, viewed women during this time period. Perhaps he was just uncomfortable with that. Perhaps it just didn't impress upon their family, their their reigning of their country like they would, or like he would have wanted it to. I don't know. It's also been proposed that it was because Cromwell disagreed with her politics. So Cromwell kind of harkens back to the guy who kind of helped initiate the shift to a more Protestant future in the Church of England, again, setting up for the divorce of Catherine earlier on. So Cromwell's been part of the picture for oh, a while. For, yeah, I must say. Yeah. As, a, as a Kingsman. Also on that note, Ives also believes that Cromwell was the one to initiate Boleyn's criminal charges. Boleyn was very religious and very charitable, more so than was expected of royalty at that time. And Cromwell was known to use religious donations for his own purposes, which Boleyn pretty openly disagreed with. And so, again, this I have to admit, this is personal conjecture, but you can imagine in that scenario, if he's levying money for deeds and yeah. services. This and, is 
and she's doing the opposite. She's doing it out of virtue. Yeah. He's like, hold on a second. You're softening my bribes. Right. You're exactly. making me look bad. I've got this illegal operation no. that I've been running. It's been a good source of extra income. I got power here. Yeah. And then and you come in and start paying off with no power. Right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And then all, and then also, you know, kind of hearing and knowing that's like, look, you're not providing an heir. Things are getting difficult between um, you and the king. Right. I'm just going to go ahead and twist that dagger that's already there, I guess, right. at this point. And I mean, again, it it sounds ruthless, but it, again, to come back to your your analogy, it feels very Game of Thrones. Yeah, man, people were just I'm just going to stay on the side of the, like, again, she's the queen consort, which as is, is a, a queen that's kind of married into the thing, as opposed to the queen like Elizabeth II, who inherited the throne and, and was the reigning right. heir. So perhaps this could just be Cromwell going, I'm just going to stick with the bloodline over here. Yeah. You know, I might, whether I agree or disagree, I'm just going to do that thing so I can firmly attach myself to this seat of, mm. of power mm. and, and all that. Man, it really does feel like Game of Thrones. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it God. Does. <laughs> so in addition to that, Henry's marriage to Boleyn caused political issues with the Holy Roman Empire. We talked about that a little bit before with the previous marriage. However, you have the emperor who would not ratify this particular marriage, creating more strife with the Holy Roman Empire. On top of that, I don't even think it has anything to do with Anne Boleyn or anybody outside of Henry because, as it turns out, Catherine of Aragon, the previous wife, was the emperor's aunt. And so it doesn't even matter like who was in the picture or what happened. Henry set himself up for a bad time yeah. when it comes to the Romans, the popes, you know, all that. Yeah. He really I did mean, him wrong if you if you're looking at it that way. I mean, look, he didn't respect his marriages, who's I mean, you know, and that's supposed to be the especially back then when they like there was so much like weight and importance in like getting married, yep. having kids, lineage, uh all that kind of stuff. And so it's like if he doesn't respect his marriage, his, his wife, mm -hmm. I don't respect the you know the different authorities especially because right. he has i mean he's abused power he's abused power and like women emotionally so Absolutely. like it, it, it's i mean go nuts it's wild uh, alliances were made and lost due to marriages especially at this time and so for someone to come through and be so flippant about it all i get it he's desperate for an heir yada 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 but like man you're really starting to to shake the rafters of Europe a little bit. Mm -hmm. But yeah. So we're kind of at a point now where we can look back and understand the perverse disposition many had towards women in addition to the complex social fabric that the crown had at that time. What with the pressures for an heir, insecurities around a wife who liked to socialize, etc. But it's clear now, I think, as we kind of come to a closing for this episode, what created the mysteries, the gaps in our knowledge but also what created some of the legends that surround Anne Boleyn. And to cap it all off, and this is where a lot of, you can start to see where even more gaps were created. To cap it all off, after her death, Henry had ordered the destruction of all portraits of Boleyn, making it such that even her physical appearance remains a mystery to this day. Oh, no. Right. So I mentioned earlier, we don't have letters, we don't have diaries. There are portraits of her that you can you can search up and there's a general like kind of shared image that you have of what she, you know, what's agreed upon to be her image. And some of that's generated from looking at Elizabeth I, combining that with Henry VIII, and then you can oh, kind of try to figure out what her mom's yeah. kind of features might be. Yeah. But, but with all that said, gaps were created because I think a lot of her history was thrown out or destroyed or, wiped. or wiped, exactly. Yeah. And to carry on into the idea of legend, it has been said that since her death, which was a very traumatic event, a very emotional event, Boleyn's ghost has been reported to be seen in multiple places around England, but most especially the Tower of London and Hever Castle, both of which are locations that she's lived in or that I've mentioned in this episode. But it's very interesting because oh, a lot there's of, a little paranormal, a little paranormal aspect in there. to it. But it is interesting because a lot of stories that feature ghosts center around traumatic events, highly emotional events that leave an impression upon however you want to interpret this physical realm, right? But like an energy, an imprint was left behind. And it's a really sad story, a really sad ending, but also morbidly fascinating in how complex and how it all unfolded. 
You know, I had in, in school, I took like European history and it's all like interesting. And these are things that you kind of gloss over and you're like, Henry VIII had six wives. And you're like, that's wild. Okay. Also the Protestant Reformation. Cool. Great. Dates that I have to remember. Yeah. But when you look a little closer, you start to go, wow, it really like I to say it one last time, it really was Game of Thrones out there. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't all that long ago. No. This was closer to now than the pyramids. I mean, we yeah. were an advanced society <laughs> and we're doing yeah. this stuff. Yep. But yeah, so now, I mean, like I mentioned, and like I kind of wanted to be vague, I implied at the beginning, we're not going to be able to fill the knowledge gaps that have been created in Anne Boleyn's life. But I think now, unlike a lot of episodes, we do have an answer as to what created the mystery. So there is some, in that sense, conclusion, some some closure but to the, the identity. for a reason. Yeah. But that is uh, the story of Anne Boleyn, mother to Queen Elizabeth I, and a very interesting woman. I wish, I wish we knew more. I wish that was riveting. That was good her, stuff. I wish her life wasn't lost to time so yeah, much. That's true. But yeah, um, some relationship stuff kicked in there. Uh -huh, and uh -huh. man, what a good month! What a what an awesome set of people. A wide array of just super interesting historical people that yeah. you know. I I hope that we helped uncover information that you know buff task force members out there might not have known about. We're mm -hmm. always trying to uncover those juicy deets. But also trying to just cover a wide array of individuals from the mystical Rasputin and some of the factual history compared to the urban legend, but also people like Shakespeare. Was it a person? Was it a group of people? Was it somebody else? Like all of these people have such different mysteries surrounding them. Nikola Tesla, his inventions, what he was, was planning, yeah, what, yeah, was, was great. what was lost to time, all those things like have all that. All of these are such unique, mysterious people, but all different mysteries in themselves. But yeah, Task Force, let us know if there's anybody else from history that you think we should cover, if you ever think we should come back to another mystery person's month, or just cover any individuals that we might have missed. And make sure to stick around because October's coming up. Ooh, hoo, hoo, hoo. So October, it's always the best month <laughs> of the year for this podcast. Not only is it uh, great topics because it's just, you know, we, we crank it up, it's mm -hmm, just extra mm -hmm. spooky and everyone's really in the mood for for the uh, mysteries and the ghouls. But um. Every year we have a huge kind of like ghost hunting event. So we like to get tangible. We like to get hands on it's, for our it's, Halloween special. It's our field work month. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do we want to lightly tease where we might be going? Sure. There's two sure. locations that we're thinking about right now. Yeah. You can so, each tease one. Okay. One location each of you. All right. I'm well, going gonna, gonna to tease what we want or kind of what we're leaning towards. Uh -huh. Yeah. The Conjuring House. Woo -hoo -hoo. That's not a tease. You just said it. You just, just said it. Said it. Oh, were we teasing? No, oh, it's fine. No, no, no. That's <laughs> we, it. We that's it. Yeah, the other care. location, if you will, it's not a backup, but it is our second place because the Conjuring House sounds yeah. incredible. I want to drag these boys through that place. I want to spend the night. I want to do all sorts of stuff. But the other place, the USS Hornet. I heard there was like how many floors? Like seventeen. Oh boy, we get lost in there for sure. I've been there once. I've ghost hunted there once. So um, that means you can compare. So, I can. so one of our uh, so one of our camera ops. I know you're sitting here you're like, oh my god, the con like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you yeah, not yeah. go there, dude. I heard there was like um, just a multitude of different floors, like like 17 floors, something like that. And um, one of our uh, coworkers, Cameron, camera op, had this. It was was setting up cameras for a, a, a different show that we did, and got lost and had to wander the ship for 30 minutes trying to find their way to everyone else. In the dark, right? In the like dark. Like the lights dark. weren't on? And I yeah. was like, bro, that's a whole nother <laughs> world of creepy. And, yeah. and it's just like four or five stories are like underwater. Yeah. And I'm just mm -hmm. like, oh God, they both suck. Yeah, dude. And you hear sounds constantly. So, and you, it's just like, you got to go, is it paranormal? Or is that the ship? Is it settling? Or is there right. something knocking on purpose? Because it's like, Sometimes it's rhythmic and sometimes it's not. Yeah. And yeah, so there, there would be portions that are like under the under, water. Under the water. Oh, a good dude. amount. Under <laughs> the water. It's an oh, aircraft. It's got so much worse than <laughs> Right. Big. Exactly. When you go, oh, when the, when the task force, I'm sure they're like, oh, Conjuring House, do that. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and now they're like, hold on. Hold Send on. these guys <laughs> to the ship. <laughs> right, right, right. Like, Let me put it into two terms. And I want to see you guys, whether you do it in the reviews, you know, on Apple, Google, Spotify with those five stars. Thank you. Whether you do it there, whether you hit us up on email, whether you hit us up on social, at Red Web Pod, Ghost Ship, Conjuring House. Two movies to go ahead and give you the words to vote on. 
Let us know where you stand. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and my again, God. Either way, are, we, at some oh. point, we're going to have to do both. You're right. At some point, <laughs> yeah, we probably do both. I mean, these are the places that we're chasing down. So, obviously, we still have to reach out to them and give right. them exactly. yeah. time. That's why we don't want to We can't just show up. We're like, we're doing it. <laughs> right, right. Like, so, I mean, we're Hold reaching, we're reaching we out. We break into the USS Horn <laughs> and then ghost hunt. That's the last thing I want to do. Not only <laughs> am I not supposed to be there, don't want to be there, no one knows that we're there. Like, so, no. if we disappear, no one no. knows. Anyway, as we close out Task Force, as always, thank you for indulging us in this wonderful month. This was, this was like a refreshing shift, a little subtle change to our normal content and our normal topics. But also, a sincere thank you to everybody who continues to pour in those five-star reviews. We are almost, boys, we are almost at 10,000 reviews on Spotify. We are getting up there. Oh, my God. But I want to light a fire, Task Force. We have about 3,300 reviews on Apple Podcasts right now. And uh, I don't know the number on Google, but feel free if you're a Google listener to hit up those reviews as well. Let's see if we can punch those numbers up. And I'm just going to throw this out there. No obligation or anything. But hey, if we happen to cross uh, five, 6,000 reviews on Apple, I might, I might, I might slay, stay the night at one of these places. What are, wait, wait, what's oh, the number at right now man. on Apple? 3,300 on 3, Apple. 3,300? Yes, sir. And some change. How about... Yeah, you put out the number. How and then about I'll stay the night? How about four thousand? You stay the night. Okay, come on. Oh, okay, <laughs> four thousand. You stay and the night. And then five thousand. You stay the night. Five thousand Christians. Christian, I stay the night. No, oh, both no, of you. No, no. Don't say you six, dare th- bring five, me in. There. Five, I was going to say six thousand Christian. Oh no, that's five thousand. Okay, Christian. okay, that's five thousand. Me, five thousand and one thousand. Five thousand and thousand. Actually, <laughs> can we go back to six thousand? <laughs> All right, five thousand. I stay the night. Five thousand and one Christian <laughs> stays the night. There it is. There it is. That's it. All right, Task Force. Thank you so much for our Persons of Intrigue Month. As always, share the podcast, word of mouth, bring those folks into the Task Force. Love the conversations we get to have with you and Fredo, Christian. I'll see you guys right back here, same time next week for yet another mystery.